Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Birla Soft Q2 FY21 earnings conference call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the call, please signal an operator by pressing star then 0 on your touchtone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Vikas Jadhav. Thank you and over to you sir. Hey thanks Raman. So good evening to all of you and thanks for joining Bilas of Q2 FY21 earnings call discussion and Vikas from Invest Relations and joining us today on this call we have uh, our CEO and MD Dharmendra Kapoor DK Roop Singh as chief business officer Shri Rangnath Kulkarni SK who is our chief delivery officer Arun Rao our chief people officer and uh, Chandrashekar Tyagarajan whom we call as Chandru as uh, you know our CFO so please note that anything which we say or refer to relating to the outlook or the future is a forward looking statement and must be read in conjunction with the disclaimer in our investor update which we have sent to the exchanges and which mentions there is that the company faces i now hand over the call to dk over to you dk please thank you vikas uh, good evening and uh, welcome to birla soft quarter 2 financial year 2021 earning call first of all i appreciate you taking out time this late evening for joining us joining us on this call i sincerely hope all of you and your loved ones are safe and keeping healthy i am very pleased to say that we continue to grow year on year and reported a 5.2% year on year growth in quarter 2 we expect to see a sequential and year on year growth for quarter 3 financial year 21 after delivering three consecutive quarters of above industry average performance our quarter 2 revenue may seem to be a bit of an outlier given the sequential decline in revenue let me address this up front before i move to the other performance indicator that show we have once again delivered continuously improving performance in the quarter one call i had highlighted about our customers seeking discounts and project deference caused due to the covid situation while we were able to negotiate and minimize impact in quarter 1 we took the full 3 year in 3 months impact of discounts and project deferments in the quarter 2 our focus was to secure long term nutd and we saw significant pro- progress in the number of nutd wins in the quarter 2 as well we won 274 million of tcv in quarter 2 which is one of the high the highest in the last seven quarter the wins include renewal worth 154 million that shows that we have been able to protect our revenue largely and about 120 million as new revenue addition to our portfolio this has not only helped us secure the run of rates going forward but will also give us growth momentum in the coming quarter further as you all would be aware we are executing a large transformational deal and we delivered a couple of milestones in the quarter one that gave us better revenue in that quarter and it was able to negate the decline that came because of the discounts and the project deferral we signed two large deals in the quarter two and the transition revenue from those deals will kick in starting quarter three as we continue to focus on execution even in this constrained environment uh the the number of wins have not slowed down for us in fact it has picked up even in the quarter 2 but the execution definitely took more time than what we thought because nobody was able to travel and we did the transition over the internet and online so it is slower than the normal but and let me uh, give everyone the confidence both the transitions are complete and that means that in the quarter 3 we will start getting the revenue for those deals that we won in the quarter 1 and quarter 2 the milestone based revenue dip was seen in the life cycle vertical and emerging horizontal so uh, we continue to remain upbeat about our winning ability in the life cycle and emerging horizontal 
and quarter two reflects only a temporary blip. We expect our upcoming quarter to take benefit from wins that we have had in the H1. Some of our other performance parameters were the best we have had post merger. Our EBITDA margin improved 158 BPS quarter on quarter at 13.9%, highest in the last seven quarters. Attrition was at 11.4%, which is the lowest, which is at the lowest point for the last eight, nine quarters. Utilization was at 83.7%, highest till date. And I'm, I'm absolutely very delighted that we have been able to bring the optimization in our execution where we have achieved the utilization, which is at par or better than many of our peers in the industry. Cash and cash equivalent are at $124.3 million, which is 917 crore, highest till date. DSO of 58 days, which is the lowest till date. Uh, total wins in quarter two at 274 million, out of which the renewed business is 154 million in quarter two and 244 million in H1. The deal signed in H1 at 454 million and 940 million in the past 12 months. So as you can as you can see that our winning momentum is continuing, hence we do not have much of the concern in the coming quarter. And the quarter two can be seen as just one of the outliers because of the reasons I earlier stated. The annuity revenue, uh, uh, we started the year with 64, 60% and it has already improved to 64% at the end of H1. We have been talking about cutting the tail. This was, this was a little hard decision for us because we have had many of the clients where we were bleeding from the perspective of the margin and the revenue was very, very small. And we had to cut the tail so that we can bring focus on the clients with whom we can grow with a lot of confidence. So we have been talking about cutting the tail and improving the revenue share from top customers. In quarter two, revenue contribution from the top customer, customers was the highest. Our top 20 customers contributed 58.5% versus 48.8% plus merger, while active customers count stood at 310 versus 366 in quarter one. We continue to be in the ISG's top 15 sourcing standout globally for the third consecutive quarter. We continue to strengthen our ERP and enterprise solution services with strong relationship with Oracle, Microsoft, and SAP. We are actively working with our partners to redefine our go-to-market models to combine the power of digital, cloud, and core enterprise solutions. While there is an impact on the discretionary spend in the short term, customers have started to reinitiate discussions on the transformation deal. So they can stay relevant in the new environment that they are also facing. We continue to see significant interest from our clients on the digital initiatives. And we continue to help our clients reimagine their IT cost structure and work with them in shifting focus to initiatives that will create business value for them. Differentiation and innovation remains on our top agenda. With our key partners such as Microsoft, Salesforce.com, ServiceNow and AWS, we are, since we are actively pursuing platform-based deals and revenue that will help us create new revenue for growth in the coming quarter. There is ongoing uncertainty due to the continued COVID-19 crisis, with a few countries going into their second phase of restriction. Birla Soft is well-placed with its clients as we have a very balanced play and portfolio between core and digital initiatives. And this makes us a highly resilient organization. Our revenue and profitability has become more predictable and stable in the past six quarters. And I'm very pleased with the progress we have made in improving both on the growth and the profitability. Just to mention again, uh, because of that one-time blitz, if we just do not consider that, 
our revenue for the rest of the portfolio is higher than what we delivered in the Q1. So that must give you the confidence that it is only an outlier for one quarter. Considering the key tenets of our strategy, we remain convinced that we have the right lever for growth and margin improvement. Our deal pipeline is robust, and I'm pleased to see that the Rock of Team is navigating very well through these challenging times. With this, I will hand over to Chandru, our CFO, for providing more color on our financials. Over to you, Chandru. Thank you, DK. I hope I'm audible to everyone. Good evening, everyone. And I hope you are keeping well, staying safe. Let me take you through the numbers in some bit of detail. Our Q2 revenue was at 115.6 million versus 121.2 million in Q1. It was up 5.2% year on year, but down 4.6% quarter on quarter. We did see cross-currency tailwinds uh, of about 100 basis points, and hence revenue in constant currency was lower to that extent. EBITDA was at $16.1 million in Q2 versus $15 million in Q1, and it was up 32.6% year on year, 7.6% quarter on quarter. EBITDA was up by 1.1 million, an improvement of 288 basis points uh, year on year and 158 basis points quarter on quarter. We were able to do better on margins as a result of the following factors. We, uh, DK spoke about our utilization improvement, and that's an improvement of 550 basis points quarter on quarter. Optimization of our subcon expenses and ongoing optimization initiatives across all of our cost levers. Our margin improvement was in spite of a rupee appreciation of around 2% in Q2, as you know, and lower revenue that uh, DK uh, alluded to. Consequently, tax for the quarter was better at 9.3 million versus 7.5 million last quarter, up. 60.7% year on year and 24.8% quarter on quarter. Our cash and cash equivalents as of 30, 30th September 2020 went up by $15.5 million quarter on quarter from 108.8 million uh, in the previous quarter, which uh, amounted to 822 crore rupees. And uh, and it moved up to 124.3 million, which is 917 crores in, the, in, in Q2. Our operating cash flow stood at uh, $18.5 million, which is 137 crore rupees in Q2. We had a capital spend of about a million dollars and our free cash for Q2 was at $17.5 million. And that is 187% of our PAT. Uh, our the board has decided on an interim dividend of rupee one per share. I'd like to point out here that we've declared dividend in the past three out of four quarters and amounting to a cloud go of approximately rupees 88 crores. And that translates to $12 million in the past one year. In Q1, we had utilized some hedges when we brought cash into India for better yields and had mentioned that we would continue to build a hedge book to our comfort level of 60 to 70% of our net forex inflows. Accordingly, the hedge book in Q2 stands at $1.77 million versus $63 million last quarter. As we grow, we will further improve our hedges based on our net, cash, net forex inflows. Overall, Q2 has been a quarter of strong performance, and our endeavor will continue to be to focus on the key metrics. With this, let me throw the floor open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask questions may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Baidik Sarkar from Unify Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, DK, hi, good evening, and congrats on our strong quarter operationally. A couple of broad questions on the industry front. 
Um, Oracle, in their recent quarters commentary, seemed to suggest that uh, there's a massive migration of in-premise uh, SAP customers to Oracle Cloud. Uh, my question is, given the size and the materiality of uh, our SAP practice, uh, would that sound like a worry to you, and what are you seeing on the ground? So, Bradik, uh, uh, yes, there are uh, opportunities that have started coming up uh, uh, about implementation of Oracle on cloud or SAP on cloud that have started coming up. But most of those initiatives are yet the new initiative that the clients have taken where the implementation is new. But if you look at the existing implementations, uh, uh, they are still largely on-premise and have to move to the cloud as it was initially thought to be uh, because there is significant amount of effort uh, and investment that is required in order for them to grow, uh, to move to cloud. And a lot of customizations have been built on those ERPs. And it is very difficult to go and use the standardized systems. And even if some of them have moved, it is a lift and shift and not adoption of the cloud ERP. So from that perspective, I believe that the larger part of their business is still on-premise, but there is improvement with respect to adoption of the cloud by the newer clients who are implementing the who are implementing the new ERP solution on the cloud. So so so, so net net as far as the saliency of our SAP practice is concerned, uh, you're, you're saying that there's no reason to be worried as yet. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. In fact, if you look at uh, uh, we are hoping that it picks up rather quicker because if it picks up rather quicker or quickly, that would mean that we will start getting lot more opportunities of migration to the cloud also. So, so and do we have so, an Oracle cloud practice of uh, scale to 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 speak of? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We we continue to do multiple opportunities of migrating as well as implementing new solutions on the cloud. So we do have the practice both in the cloud as well as in the SAP. And both in the Oracle and the SAP. Okay. Uh, any one off in the OPEX this quarter that can potentially eat into our margins in the coming period? Uh, just, just wanted to understand uh, how, how we see margins. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, your voice was not very clear. Can you repeat that? Apologies. I was trying to understand if there was any one off in our operating expenses this quarter that you think will uh, come back after the second quarter. And, uh, oh, Badik, I'm sorry. Uh, it's not clear. I'm not sure if it is because of me or in general, others are also not uh, able to get it. But if no, you have it, got it, maybe clear. you can repeat the question. So I'll, I'll, I'll apologize. Let me try again. Any one offs in our operating expenses that can come back and hurt our margins in the coming quarter? No, no, no. Absolutely. No, no, no. It is a fundamental shift that we have made in our operating parameter. The utilization is here to stay. Okay? Similarly, if you look at the uh, changes that we started bringing into our bench costs, our delivery overheads, our GNA costs, these are permanent changes. These are not one-off changes. We are going to provide the increments to our people in the quarter four, starting from the January one, but we have made the plans as to how will we go and improve our rest of the operation, continue to improve in the quarter three also so that we are able to negate that impact. So thanks. And just one last question. So in terms of a buyback, uh, I understand there's been an interim dividend, but I think there were thoughts of a larger buyback. Uh, uh, any 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 thoughts of the board on that? No, not yet. Uh, we have discussed it, okay, but uh, uh, board has said that they will continue to look at the market condition and also our growth plan because we are getting onto the long-term planning and, uh, uh, and we want to look at all the considerations before we take that decision. So there is no final decision as yet on that, but the discussion definitely is there on the table. Sure. Best wish of the time, Mayer. I'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Bradley. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shraddha from Asian Market Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Congratulations, TJ, on a strong deal signing um, yet again. 
question on margin first. Uh, most of the margin improvement for us this quarter has been led by leveraging of our SGN expense. And if you look at the gross margin impact, it's down on a Q on Q basis. So, I mean, how should we read margins? What really went into, you know, a steep declining SGNA? Because most of the companies have shown a better margin improvement led by gross margin improvement, which is not the case uh, in, our, uh, in our company. So, could you just elaborate on the margins, please? Well, in our case also, there is an improvement in the gross margin. But as you know that we have gone through the merger situation, we had higher spend tipping in the uh, uh, in the delivery overhead or the uh, GMA uh, line items also. So we have taken the optimization on every single line item, even on the gross margin side also, because as you can imagine that during the quarter one when the projects are getting deferred or, or there are discounts being given, despite getting the full impact for the quarter, we have delivered much better EBITDA than the previous quarter. So it is coming through improvements in every single line item. Uh, we can just to persist on this on gross margin, we are actually down by 250 bits Q on Q. We were at 42%, 41.6% last quarter, and we are down to 39% in this quarter. That is because of some of the shift in the uh, expenses that we have done. Earlier, those expenses were sitting into the other expenses, there used to be another expenses item, and uh, that used to be considered as part of the GNA. For example, those were the that was the cost that was being incurred on on the employees who are working on the project. We have moved that back into the gross margin so that we continue to improve on there rather than we ignore that. So we have done a little bit of shifting of that also, and that's the reason that you may see that uh, it is the higher cost there, but it is after improving a lot on the gross margin side as well. Right. And so, uh, I mean, uh, we had stated our margin guidance of band of 15% by Q1 of the uh, next financial year. So, how, I mean, are, are we committed to that margin guidance or do we see it happening much sooner than expected? Now that we're yes, already absolutely. at 15% margin. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I still am committed to delivering 15% EBITDA uh, in the quarter one of the next financial year. And we are, we are pretty much in line with what has been planned, and we are going and moving as per our own targets and plans. Sure. And just one last question, if I can. Uh, your business is also down by 15%. So is this uh, because of that milestone project completion, was that a uh, your business that uh, showed the That is right. That is right. That is right. Sure. That's helpful. Sir. Thank you and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sandeep Agarwal from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Good evening uh, to the management team and very good set of deal signing and exhibition. Uh, so, Dikki, I have a couple of questions. One, uh, is there anything which has happened, especially in the life sciences? Is it the completion of some project which has hurted us there or it is something else, number one. And number two, you know, the way we are signing deals, if you take into account both uh, total TCV, uh, we are much ahead of our quarterly revenue run rate. In fact, uh, almost double, I would say. So uh, does it give you a very good visibility into the next year, a big jump in growth? Or you think that the signings are for a longer period of time, which, you know, doesn't necessarily imply a very big shift jump in growth next year. That is question number two. And question number three, what are we doing strategically on the cloud side? Because, you know, as you, you would have seen that, you know, the whole attention has shifted from now more from even digital to cloud because most of the clients are thinking that, you know, cloud should be prioritized a little more because of the kind of traffic that is happening. So uh, any thoughts on that? Side? So these three questions, if you can answer them, please answer yeah, absolutely. I think your assumptions in the first questions are absolutely right. Uh, the impact on the life sciences is due to the completion of the milestone that we have had with Invocare. Uh, and uh, uh, and, and uh, that's the reason that it has impacted the life sciences vertical and the emerging horizontal higher than the others. While it is widespread because 
uh, almost every horizontal uh, deal with the invocator uh, engagement, but it was highest in the emerging uh, uh, horizontal. Uh, now, um, um, is uh, rest of the part of the business uh, uh, doing very well with respect to making the wins? Absolutely. Do we still have the confidence in the life sciences? In fact, we have more confidence in the life sciences because when we complete any execution with a larger transformation program, it definitely gives more confidence for us to go in the market and win similar deals. So from that perspective, we stay very confident because our fundamental growth story is still intact and working out very well for us. And that is reflected through the wins that we have seen in the quarter one and quarter two. And you are absolutely right in assuming that this is what is going to give us much better visibility in the coming quarters and in the next financial year also for the significant growth that we can achieve. So I am absolutely very upbeat uh, on that front. It is just so that if the quarter one and quarter two, we did not have the COVID situation, we could have started the transition and completed the transition much early on and would have been able to fill the gap in the quarter two itself. But we finished the transition in both the large deals uh, 10 days back, and it has been approved by the client, and we have reached to the study state. That would mean that our revenue will start clicking in the quarter three and quarter four, and hence it will give us the additional growth that we were looking for. Okay, and you know, uh, the, the uh, one final question, if I may, uh, and I will come back in queue if required. So, you know, only one thing I wanted to know, DK, there is a big uh, availability of very good set of talent in the market, if you see, because of two of the very large players uh, probably going through some crisis kind of situation. Uh, uh, so, uh, are we using this opportunity to build uh, big leadership positions uh, or leadership in our areas where you, we see big opportunity going forward because see, the reason I am asking this question is I am seeing that you know many of the leaders from these two large players are actually uh, joining a lot of IT com uh, larger IT companies and even some of the mid cap IT companies so some of the mid cap peers are actually adding a lot of talent which is very good quality very high level talent which is available because of some internal issues of two large players. Uh, so I would wonder what are we doing on that side? Are we bringing in more leaders? Because obviously the way we are signing deals and the opportunities coming up in this cycle, uh, you would be uh, definitely be looking forward to add some serious talent on the emerging technology side and particularly I would say on the cloud side. So what is your thought if you can share on that side? No, I, I think there is a very, very important point that you mentioned. Uh, I'm sorry I can't take the name of those companies, but we definitely have hired some of very good folks from those uh, uh, companies. In fact, just last week, uh, one of our leader in digital uh, joined from a large consulting company because uh, it is not only with the IT service provider, even the consulting companies are also going through the tough period because nobody is spending money on the transformation program. So we hired our digital leader and uh, 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 from, from those companies. At the same time, some of the folks who joined us in the SAP side and in the other ERP area, they came from those companies that you are talking about. So we absolutely continue to look for key people who are available in the industry who can give us good capability and good talent. So we definitely continue to always look for and continue to hire wherever we need to build our capability better than what we have today. Okay, thanks. That's very helpful. Best of luck for the current quarter. I will come back in the queue. I have two more follow-ups, but I will come back in the queue. Thank you. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Madhu Babu from Centrum Broking. Please go ahead. Yeah, sir. Uh, just on uh, Invocare deal, would, would that be helping a reference client for some of the larger clients? Because And second is a profile of our top 15 accounts. So most of them are kind of mid-sized enterprises in their respective verticals. So, uh, I mean, is it that the reason where we had to give discounts and all because they are struggling in the COVID situation or uh, just a view on, you know, how the discounts have actually, you know. But look, first of all, uh, our, top, yeah. Yeah, uh, our top clients are not all mid, mid they are There are larger uh, companies also, larger clients also who are there. But 
uh, you know, interestingly, it is not the smaller player who ask for the discount. It is generally the larger player. Because you can give the discount only where there is a volume. If there is no volume, the client will not come and ask for the discount. At the same time, we will, we will not have as much bandwidth to provide them the discount also. What we have to look at is that wherever we are giving the discount one, it is not a discount forever. It is a discount for the limited period. So that means that we still have the headroom for margin growth in the coming period when the discount will shut down, okay? Uh, that period will be over. So that is one thing that we have to uh, be uh, uh, aware of. At the same time, wherever we have given some discount, we are negotiating with the customer. How can we compensate that with the growth house or with the initial growth? So that negotiation also continues to go on because it is not a, it is a tricky strategy when the client asks the discounts, we need to compensate it either with the growth or we need to look at how we continue to grow with them and also be able to improve the operating parameter so that we are able to claw back the discount that we are given to the client. In some of the cases, we have moved people from on site to offshore. Okay, we have removed senior people, rotated them out and replaced that with the junior people so that we get back to the same level of margins that are there with those clients despite giving them the discount. So, so that work generally takes time three to six months because every rotation and every change will happen slowly because there is a handing over process that happens. So from that perspective, we are pretty confident that we will be able to log at the discount that we are given and, and we'll be back there. So I'm not overly concerned. Uh, my concern remains that how do we continue to protect our revenue with these top 10 top 20 customers because that is the first priority. We know how to improve our margins and operating parameters, and we continue to negotiate with the customers so that we do not take the hit for the longer time. And sir, on-site has increased substantially this quarter, revenues from on-site, and despite that, revenues have been weak. So just wanted to understand on that. And third is uh, just on this 3Q growth. So would you have a strong uptick in 3Q despite furloughs and all that, like, you know, 3-4% QOQ growth can we expect in 3Q? So on-site, yes, it is improving because uh, for simple reason that uh, you can't make people travel. Also, there is not too much of work that can shift during this time. So we have to depend on the on-site uh, uh, folks to get the work completed. So that's the reason that you see uh, there is a jump onto the on-site revenue. But but we have to always continue to keep the balance between the outside and offshore, and we continue to do that. When it comes to the third quarter, yes, we definitely believe that there will be growth. Okay, and uh, and and we are uh, as as we have made good wins in the quarter one and quarter two. There is a good uh, execution that has already started that is going to give us higher revenue in the quarter three and quarter four. So do expect growth in the quarter three and quarter four. Yes, sir. despite high onset, the revenue decline was around four and a half percent. So that is more worrisome. That is what I was asking. Thanks. Yeah, correct. Because uh, the work that we have completed, that work happened a lot on the offshore side. So from that perspective, you know, uh, it all depends upon that uh, the run of revenue, whether it was from onsite or offshore, and resultant revenue looks higher at onsite uh, onsite this time. But I'm sure that it will continue to remain in balance. Are going forward also. Okay, sir. Thanks and all the best. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhishek Shikandar from Ilara Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and uh, congrats on a good execution. Um, so my first question is uh, regarding just a clarification. Uh, so there is a clarification uh, about a care ratings, uh, uh, you know, reaffirming your bank facility. So just wanted to know, is this a, just a facility which got uh, our rating or we are thinking of any long-term, you know, loans or uh, just wanted your clarification? So I would uh, request Chandru to answer this question uh, because he is much closer to those details. Chandru, can you please uh, 
help me answer this question? Sure, sure DK. Thanks for the question, Abhishek. Uh, so we already had a... We seem to have lost the line for Mr. Chandrasekhar. Please connect it while I reconnect him. We have the line for Mr. Chandrasekhar reconnected. Uh, Hello. What do you saw? Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Sandra. Yeah. Uh, just, sorry, the call dropped. Um, so, I, Abhishek, uh, to your question, uh, CARE uh, had already rated us, uh, you know, in the past, and it was a renewal of the CARE rating. So, uh, we went through a review. And CARE has reaffirmed our rating as uh, AA minus. Uh, to your second part of the question, there are no immediate plans for uh, the, you know funding or borrowing, but this is just uh, this is uh, you know part of our exercise to to ensure that we have uh, you know we have all of our limits in place, and we also want to make sure that we have the right uh, uh, pricing from the institution. So this rating uh, reaffirmed is going to certainly help us. Uh, keep our rates and even better then. Uh, that's helpful, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, the second question is for uh, you, uh, DK, sir. Uh, the, you know, if I heard you correctly, you said, uh, uh, you know, if not for the pricing discounts, our absolute dollar number for Q2 could have been uh, better than Q1. Uh, did I hear it correctly? Not only discount, but also the deferred project. Sorry, sir. It is both discount plus deferred project. Uh, those those are the part of the reason that our revenue decline is there. But there is also a portion that is coming from the one-time completion that happened in the quarter one, and we had higher revenue for Invocia. And now Invocia revenue has stabilized because we were going through the transition in the US, APAC, as well as in Europe, that we completed and we, uh, we achieved the milestone. So that part of the uh, revenue collection was over. And hence, you see that also contributing to the decline for the quarter two. OK, OK, understood. That's helpful. So sir, uh, you know, given uh, the strong order books that we have signed, and uh, you know these pricing discounts are likely behind uh, would it be fair to assume that uh, by next q3 or q4 we should be exiting at the q4 fy20 exit rate or that will be a tough ask so uh, um, we continue to work that how do we beat that okay so as you know that we have been beating our year on year uh, 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 growth definitely uh, for all the uh, same quarters in the previous financial year. So far, we have been doing better than them, and that's the plan for going forward as well. Okay, okay. So, um, okay, that's fair enough, sir. And uh, just one follow up on uh, just one question on the margins. Uh, uh, now, given that, uh, you know, the other expenses have dropped substantially, and we had talked of, uh, you know, MIS integration and, uh, uh, you know, other rationalization of expenses, uh, would it be fair that, uh, uh, you know, the margin profile of the firm can remain at the current levels or expand. Uh, and I'm asking from the perspective that uh, would you also have a, a consideration for wage hikes given that many other organizations have, uh, you know, given wage hikes uh, uh, or ha or would give wage hikes from January quarter? Correct. So, so we are also giving the wage hikes from the January uh, and we have taken that into the concentration. We believe that uh
uh, the changes that we made in the last two quarters on our uh, operating parameters are very much fundamental and foundational in nature. And that would mean that that margin profile is going to say, yes, the newer expenses such as wage hike will come, but our objective remains that we will earn all the hikes that we give by improving our productivity and by improving our efficiency. And we continue to work in that direction. So our, our goal of reaching 15% EBITDA in the quarter one of the next financial year stays. Uh, that is helpful, sir. Thank you for taking my questions. I'll uh, join in the queue for follow-up. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ravi Menon from Motila Loswal. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, BK, you explained this quite a bit, uh, but, you know, I think, uh, sorry to hop on it, uh, but, uh, you know, beyond uh, the temporary uh, rate uh, cut that we've given uh, in the care, uh, you know, is there any kind of cost takeout that was promised as part of uh, the transformation program? So, you know, that's a more permanent uh, change in the revenue. No, there was nothing uh, that was not as part of the plan for Invercare. There was no cost takeout uh, uh, that we wanted to give or committed to give additionally other than that will come by improving the efficiency after transitioning the work to us. So it is in normal case where they have offshored the work and they will get the benefit from the business case that has been created but there is nothing substantial or different that we plan to provide them that would result into any margin or revenue decline. Right, that's what I meant. I mean, so how much of the revenue decline would you say is, you know, uh, due to uh, the planned uh, decline, uh, you know, because of the offshore move uh, and, you know, the, the transformation that's been done and how much would it be uh, the temporary uh, rate cut? So approximately, if you look at the gap uh, due to uh, the invoice here is approximately three, three and a half million dollars. Okay, uh, and rest of the part is due to the uh, full quarter discount and deferment uh, 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 there. So, so that's the uh, ratio between the two reasons. Okay. Okay. Great. And uh, you know, what sort of deals are you uh, uh, have you signed? You know, about this, uh, the new deals that you signed. Are these with uh, you know, new customers? Uh, you know, are these outsourcing deals? Uh, or are they uh, more projects? Uh, because I, I thought I saw in the press release that it seemed to be a lot more uh, you know, implementation programs. Uh, so, uh, how much of this do you think is annuity, and you know, maybe uh, how much of it would be uh, consumed in say less than two years? Yeah, the larger deals that we find, these are the annuity deals for three years or five years. Uh, the larger deals that we have signed, uh, uh, be it with the energy customers or uh, what we saw with the uh, uh, manufacturing and all that, they were all uh, a three year and five year uh, run. So that's the reason that you see that 4% uptick that we have seen in H1 for our NOT revenue. And uh, you will see the same uptick in the H2 also because now when we start executing, that means our NOT revenue will grow. Uh, uh, there were not as many transformation projects that happened in the H1, except for a few which were already in the motion for our clients and they could not stop. But uh, other than that, you would see that net new wins have reduced, whereas the new revenue for existing customers have really grown significantly. So from that perspective, that gives me a lot more confidence that that our margin profile will not go down because the margin profile takes a hit when you uh, win a net new customer and get through the whole process. But most of our customers, where even we have won the larger deals, these were, some of these were consolidation deals that happened in our favor. And that means that we are going to continue to improve on our margin going forward also. And there is not significant risk that remains with those projects that there will be run of revenue and, uh, uh, and, and, and these are all three to five years. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, one question to Chandru on uh, the dividend payout, uh, you know, if I look at it and you know, your DSOs have been coming off, uh, and that's uh, really great, you know, but we've now, I think, come to a level where uh, we should probably expect that to go up from here, right? Uh, would you think so? And what sort of cash conversion should we see to prop, uh, Pat, uh, post that? So, um, on the on the DSO point, uh, I, I I do think we will stabilize at between the 63 and 65 days. And you're right that we, as we grow uh, going forward, as DK said, we should see uh, some uptick in our DSO. But we expect to uh, we expect to uh, uh, steady at between 63 and 65 days. Now, what impact will it have on our on our uh, cash uh, quarter on quarter? I, I still do believe that uh, you know our our cash will continue to uh, will uh, stay stable and improve as we go forward. Of course, we we have to look at what further uh, you know capex and other investments that we will continue to make as we grow, and 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 that that's an item that we will take on an ongoing basis. But uh, the the uh, the cash inflows will certainly. Uh, improve at uh, on an absolute basis. Right, uh, and on the long term assets, you know what uh, we see as other financial assets, uh, the fifty one crore point three crores. Uh, are these uh, you know long term fixed deposits or uh, mutual fund holdings, or how should what should what's this? Yeah, so they are uh, they are investments that we have made this past quarter in. Uh, in fixed deposits in highly rated uh, uh, companies, and also in uh, uh, you know, and also in liquid mutual funds that we have invested during the past quarter. The financial assets that you're looking at are are predominantly the fixed deposits. Great, thanks. And so, so you know, given that our cash flow is really healthy, and I think the current dividend uh, payout you know implies roughly about I think 25 percent payout more or less. Uh, you know, decays said very clearly that there is no transformational M&A that, you know, but you would be looking at only tuck in for capabilities. Uh, so what's the need to, uh, you know, keep adding cash? Uh, so, you know, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't it be prudent to consider a, uh, you know, better cash payout? Well, there is, uh, let, me, let me answer. Uh, um, if I look at a couple of quarters back, we were of the opinion that we need to see our revenue and profit margin to be at a stable point to look fundamentally strong. Only then we will think about any new acquisition or go for non-linear uh, growth related uh, opportunities. I believe that today, if you look at, I have not more confidence in the stability and the consistency of our revenue and the growth uh, than what I saw two or three quarters back. So we are discussing that how do we look at the assets that are available in the industry today. Some of those are required because there is a big shift in the ask that our clients have. Uh, there is a different focus that would be required, different set of capabilities that would be required if we had to continue to grow. So we have started looking at those opportunities as well, but we will go for those opportunities only if it is going to help us scale our revenue, scale our existing services and offerings also. So we are working in that direction. That would mean that we will need cash for those opportunities as well. And hence, we are open for taking those steps today. But we are going to be very careful with respect to where do we invest and what kind of growth should we expect from those kind of investments. I dig it, but given that you have said, you know, there will clearly be no acquisitions for revenue, uh, I think, you know, this uh, shouldn't be very sizable by time. You are sitting on quite a good cash balance. Uh, so, uh, you know, to, to think that... Uh, you, know, you could improve your return ratios uh, with uh, you know improved uh, dividend payout, or through a one-time uh, buyback uh, and get some of this off, uh, because otherwise you know it suppresses the return ratios. Correct. No, absolutely. I think we have given uh, our request 
and we have started discussing that at the board level, uh, all the possibilities. So as I said uh, uh, in the beginning, that those considerations are definitely there in front of the board, and we are going to decide on that. Our objective definitely will remain, how do we give uh, and maximize our, our returns to our stakeholders and shareholders, so we definitely will continue to work in that direction. Great, thank you, Ambassador Mark. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rohit Balakrishnan from Riddhi Capital. Please go ahead. Hey, and, uh, and team, uh, uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, DK, just on this uh, revenue uh, uh, trajectory going ahead and given uh, our uh, very strong deal uh, session new deal as well. So, um, uh, I think uh, I missed the part when you mentioned about somebody was asking about beating the Q4 base, which has been the highest. So, uh, can you just allude, uh, what was your answer to that? I mean, uh, do we expect to sort of grow beyond uh, the Q4 base that we had set uh, at the end of this, uh, at the end of the last financial year? In this Correct. financial year, I mean. So, so absolutely. Uh, no, we are very clear with our objectives. Uh, while I see the decline in this quarter, our first focus definitely is that we continue to grow quarter on quarter. That is our first objective very clearly. Uh, even when we have seen the decline, our objective doesn't change. We want to grow quarter on quarter in the upcoming quarters. At the same time, the second objective is that we also continue to grow year on year so that we are always showing the growth uh, in our revenue year on year also. So that's the second. And third, that I am uh, uh, always committed to that we have to get to the EBITDA level at par with the industry, and we need to deliver in the quarter one next year at 15%, and I'm committed to that also. Got it. Uh, also, uh, DK, you mentioned that this decline, I think about $3 million or somewhere about that number, was driven by InvaCare. Uh, so, uh, uh, so InvaCare was roughly uh, $24 million kind of run rate yearly. So, uh, this was, uh, does that, I mean, so $6 million quarterly, so does that change or uh, because we've shifted uh, offshore, uh, to offshore or is there, uh, or did I miss that part? Uh, so just one clarification on that. No, I think uh, uh, we will stabilize at $24 million every year from now onwards. So that will remain. Oh, got it. And uh, DK, just also in terms of uh, 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 margin outlook, so obviously uh, very heartening to hear that you were committing to 15% Q1. But uh, a couple of questions. So one, in terms of our cost, there has been significant improvement. And also while our offshore uh, declined uh, quarter on quarter, but for most of the IT companies that, that have come out there, uh, they have seen a big uh, tailwind uh, in their offshore mix. So given these two, uh, uh, given the cost decline and the offshore onshore, uh, offshore tailwind, uh, is there is there a, uh, a, a thinking that we can perhaps even like uh, go uh, either achieve 15% earlier and also go beyond that, uh, given the con uh, given these two tailwinds apart from the operational improvements that we have? No, uh, I'm sure uh, because. You know, uh, profit is never sufficient. We always want to do more and more. Uh, so absolutely, we are also uh, working towards that. But we also have to look at that we all will need significant investment in order for us to be prepared for better growth. So the reason that I want to restrict myself to 15% is that while I deliver higher than that, I deliver higher margin so that I'm able to invest back for the higher growth. So that's the clear objective. And I stated that in the um, three or four quarters back, also the same uh, uh, question and the answer that I gave was that we want to be at the level where we are able to deliver internally more than 15%, but I committed to the board that the higher piece, I will invest back into the business for the uh, growth in the subsequent quarter. Got it. And uh, just two more questions. One was on the, again, just a clarification. So 
someone had asked about uh, rapid uh, the side by staff where they were talking about rapid deployment towards or rapid movement of their client base towards cloud so uh, 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 and even oracle has been talking about it so is that is a uh, a tailwind for us or a headwind for us given our existing revenue base uh, there would be some uh, i mean there would be some run off there and, and in general uh, if my understanding is correct that the deal size uh, or the implementation revenues for uh, for cloud deals as incremental revenues to be lower that was the first question and second i just uh, uh, round about my questions uh, the second question was on tax rate so we still continue to sort of pay 30% uh is there any thinking to move towards 25% to lower tax rate yeah so i will ask chandru to answer the second question after i finish the first one if you look at uh, uh you know it is a miss no more that miss no more that uh, uh, the revenue of migration to the cloud or the rapid deployment on the cloud will reduce the revenue coming for the service provider because it is not that the complexity has reduced in fact what has happened is that earlier there was a monolithic implementation that used to happen hence the revenue looked higher but when it is happening on the cloud this has got distributed from one big monolithic component to multiple components which integrate with each other so on a particular component it may look like the revenue is smaller but when you go and end up integrating it with the other products other solutions other components on the cloud you come back to the same level of implementation cost earlier the entire implementation used to happen in one go now that will get scattered and will happen in the piece but that does not mean then the implementation cost will go down if you pick up any of the product even if you pick up sap on cloud now success factor sits outside the sap and now this becomes two components similarly there are other solutions that are there on the cloud they sit outside the core sap but they do get integrated with the sap so if you look at the total cost of ownership it may still be either equal or higher because you have to spend on the integration if some components are on, on cloud other components are on premise you get higher cost of the integration so the total cost of ownership doesn't go down it still comes but it doesn't come in one big chunk it comes in the smaller chunk totally if you are happy with the answer uh, uh, if you have uh, if you are happy with the answer i can ask chandru to answer the second question yes dk that was very uh, very elaborate thank you i got it okay on the second part of the question around tax rates uh, we continue to evaluate that uh, we we obviously need to look at a, a few factors uh, the the defer tax assets in our balance sheet and the mat credits uh, already available versus the uh, improvement that we will get from the moving of tax uh, regime from the old to the new uh, so this this is being monitored on a continuous basis and we will uh, you know we will take uh, the decision at the appropriate time got it uh thank you very much and all the very best for the coming quarters uh, i'll be in touch thanks thank you thank you the next question is from the line of ashish agarwal from principal mutual fund please go ahead oh uh, yeah thanks uh, sir most of my question have been answered just couple of them i uh, wanted to understand you said that uh, the revenue decline in this quarter was also because some of the projects got deferred by the client so just wanted to understand has those projects started and will we see those revenues starting to come in second half uh, and also on the pricing side uh, are these prices for short term discounts you have given or these are for the duration of uh, the msas uh, for the client Uh, and last on the pipeline side if you can quantify how much the pipeline has grown on a year on year or on a q on q basis that will be really helpful so thanks okay great uh, if we look at uh, from the perspective of the deferred projects some of them uh, have started trickling in but i believe it is going to come back in the quarter 4 for us because that would be quarter 1 for the uh, us market and they all are going through their budgeting exercise 
and that means that quarter one is the time when we should uh, look forward to having them back uh, and uh, start it again. Uh, uh, on the discount side, uh, we have not changed the prices. We had given the discount. It is a one-time discount, limited period discount. So they will definitely start coming back in the Q3. Uh, 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 many of them uh, will start coming in the Q3, and rest will come in the Q4. So that are all going to get reversed uh, because we are not changing the rates, we are not changing the pricing. Uh, uh, then there was question on the uh, pipeline. Let me ask Roop to answer that question. Uh, uh, Roop is our chief business officer, and there is a significant improvement that we have seen in the uh, pipeline increase, and I don't want to take this shine away from him, so let him talk about this. So thank you, uh, DK. So, you know, uh, our annual pipeline, if I look at it say, in the last one year, we have moved our pipeline, active pipeline, from roughly about 500 million annually to about close to 900 million at this point in time. So that's a significant jump. Now, quarter on quarter, that translates anywhere between an increase of 15 to 20% increase of our pipeline. Uh, and we will continue to see that trend. And the significant shift is the type of deals and the type of deal value pipeline that we are getting. And that has improved significantly. Got it. But, uh, sir, will you see some of these pipeline, um, a lot of these deals will be more offshore centric or these will be uh, similar to what happened during the pre-COVID time? So, you know, when we, uh, we don't see the difference in terms of, uh, you know, a mix of whether there's more offshore centric or on-site centric at this point in time, uh, it will all depend on the execution and where the customer feels based on the COVID scenario that is, whether we could do, do the project on a distributed model. And in that case, you know, we will see more work shift towards offshore. But the deal structures are not changing in terms of where, you know, it's not being defined as to more off-site, on-site at this point in time. Thanks. Thanks a lot, sir. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Dipesh Mehta from MK Global. Please go ahead. A uh, couple of questions, I think. First about the utilization, DK, earlier you indicated about your comfort range of utilization was around 82 to 83 percentage. So any rethinking on that number, you think we can operate much higher comfortably? Second question on the tail account rationalization, do you believe we are largely done through tail account rationalization and now it should stabilize and grow? Do you think there is uh, still some time to go? before we reach some stability in active client. Our third question is about annuity revenue. Can you help us where we have reached uh, in annuity revenue mix perspective? And last uh, is if you can provide some color about the deal with uh, intake this quarter, remain very strong. So if you can provide some additional detail on the deal win. Thank you. Definitely. On the utilization, uh, uh, I believe that uh, uh, there is a lot of hard work done by SK and team in order for us to improve our utilization, and we are reached to uh, closer, closer to 84%. But I believe that if we remain at 83% or 84%, I think this is a very good utilization to have. Because if we continue to deliver the utilization at that level, our next goal would be how do we touch upon the other parameters so that by keeping utilization constant, we are able to get the efficiency from improving on the other parameters such as pyramid and the other things. So that is what will be the focus going forward. So I don't think that we will run after improving the utilization more, but how the same utilization will give us better efficiency will be the focus for us going forward. Looking at the tail account, uh, uh, I believe that, yes, we have made significant progress on uh, getting rid of our tail that was not moving. That means that uh, the margins are very low, but revenue growth is not happening or revenue is very, very negligible. 
uh, because at the end we should know where we are going to put that of our investment. Having said that, tail never finishes. Tail is something that, is, is something that we continue to develop going forward also. And what we have to look at is that we continue to assess every second or third quarter as to what is the situation of the tail. Is there a tail account that we acquired thinking that it will become big, but it has not for a year time, and then is a time to take a decision on that. So it is a continuous process, but I believe that we have largely taken the actions where the actions are required. And then we'll continue to work in the direction that uh, uh, how do we uh, make the new wins, but uh, only sustain it if it is going to grow in the future. So that's uh, my answer on to the NOT side, uh, sorry, on the tail account side. On the NOT side, as I mentioned, we have moved, by, moved up by 4% in the H1. And that, in my opinion, is very good because uh, this is something that is going to give us much higher uh, order booking for the next financial year. And our focus will remain that we go after those deals that we can sign it for the multi-year and for the multi-services. So, uh, so I'm very satisfied uh, with that progress that is happening. And, uh, and on the deal win side, let me ask uh, and request Rook to give a color to the kind of deals that we have won uh, uh, in this quarter as well. Yeah, so, you know, thank you, DK. So the deals that we are actually going after specifically and the opportunities is the large sort of AMS type activities. So, you know, application management uh, uh, and UT type deals, that's number one. Number two, we have also seen a, a fair amount of ask from our clients in terms of uh, expectations on the user experience. So that has enabled us to significantly grow our digital component of the business. So how they are actually either looking at uh, you know revenue generation activities or they're looking at uh, client experience, and that is a lot. So it's a mix of both. You know, significant wins have been in terms of the large annuity deals, AMS type deals, and then added digital components on top of that. The second, of course, is you know we continue to work with our clients to extend the life of their current ERP platforms given the cost optimization. So that has also helped, and that's been converted into annuity given that you're supporting them on the uh, current ERP platform. And the third, and also we've continued to see some implementation uh, in either, either ERP implementation or platform implementation. That probably gives you a mix of what we are uh, focused on. Correct, and I would just extend okay. that answer by saying that uh, there, is a, there is a big shift that we have seen that even in those support and maintenance kind of deals or ASM deals, there is going to be a digital component in that also. So we are seeing that as clients continue to adopt the digital technology, even in the ASM, there is a digital component that has started coming in. So with that, that shows that, that the level of competence and capability will continue to improve, and the level of differentiation that we had to provide in the business model will be very crucial. And that, that definitely will provide us a tailwind in order to go and close those kind of deals in the future as well. DK, uh, on the utilization, if I may add, while we maintain 82 to 84% healthy utilization, some of the um, efficiency drivers for delivery and execution will continue. What it helps is to induct fresh campus graduates that help me to improve margin over a period of time and also create a pool that helps us to accelerate our growth. So that that kind of efficiency we should be able to bring by maintaining the utilization. Uh, thanks, Dika. Just one num uh, annuity number. What was the number for at the end of Q2? I missed it. You said 4% increase in H1, but what was the absolute number? 64%. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ashish Kacholia from Lucky Investment. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, I uh, Congratulations on a good set of deal wins. My question is whether in the future uh, the customers are going to ask for any on-site presence at all or, I mean, it's going to be pretty much left to the discretion of the contractor to decide on-site offshore. So, 
uh, even today also the client is always in the discussion when we decide what part of the work has to be delivered at on site and what part of the work will be delivered at offshore uh, and uh, some of the parts that has to happen at workshore uh, at offshore will first begin at on site and then will get transition to the offshore so it always is a mutual agreement that happens however if you look at the situation is also changing a little bit with the new visa rules coming into the play and we are working on now a completely different model that can be called as a boundaryless border uh, boundaryless uh, uh, operating model where it will not matter from where the work is getting delivered the virtual teams will be able to come together and deliver the work that is required by the client earlier client wanted one odc and all the people to be in lock and key under that odc but today client knows that that is all his people are sitting at one location there is a risk of infection getting spread within the team and that would mean suddenly the whole team is quarantined so considering all that they are far more open that we have people distributed across multiple locations and even multiple countries so that gives us larger flexibility that we can provide them the operating model that is widespread and we can choose best of breed people wherever they are available rather than trying to bring all the people into one location so that is very exciting uh, piece of work that we are doing it with a couple of our customers where we are defining the boundaryless working environment for them so on site and offshore slowly may lose the meaning as it was traditionally known and in future it may take shape very very take take very different different shape so that we are able to create the tools put up the tools that bring the virtual team together and still be able to deliver without letting clients know if there is any impact because the team is sitting in the multiple locations uh just a add on question you know uh, earlier it used to be that uh, the person in the front end used to understand from the client what, what are their new projects and what are their how to kind of go about starting up the project now given that uh, most people have gotten used to working uh, from remote locations during uh, covid does that uh, front end project understanding transitioning and uh kind of initial implementation uh has that lost its uh, kind of uh, importance in the overall scheme of things or you feel that you still need uh, the front end teams to kind of start off the execution and then transition it offshore yeah no i think this is the absolutely brilliant question because uh you know uh, as i said that the execution slowed down a little bit in the quarter 1 and quarter 2 there are two large deals that we closed in which 100% transition happened without even a single travel everything over the web over the zoom and the microsoft team calls the whole transition has happened one of the transition was in an environment which was hostile transition that means the existing incumbent was not very much willing to help and support but we were able to finish that also with them successfully so that gives us good confidence that in these two quarters we have been able to create two very good case studies where we can do the transition without making any person travel it brings the cost drastically down but at the same time it gives the confidence to the client that it is not necessary that i need to have all the people sitting next to me if i have to transition the knowledge so so as they say that necessity is the mother of invention i think that is what happened in the last two quarters where uh, uh, we have closed these two uh, transitions very very successfully will it lose the meaning in the future no once the travel is back i'm sure there will be different type of pressure that can i have person next to me can that transition that are going to happen in 3 months be done in 2 months if the person can travel yes those kind of aspects will remain but the confidence will be there with the customer that even if that person is sitting away the knowledge transition can happen without too much assessment that it may take 5 10% efforts more but it can still happen and do you think that the importance of client mining 
uh, and uh, the front end person being out there that remains intact pretty much for client mining uh, purposes yeah it, it it does remain because uh, <coughs> connect from the relationship perspective because people don't buy just from anyone they buy when there is a relationship between between people of the two companies so i don't think that is going to go away uh, however i think the significance of inside sales or being able to provide the first level of connect to explain what are the offerings can happen from any location and that would mean that the cost of that inside sales will come down because a lot can be achieved by sitting at offshore also but in my opinion to close a deal it is always good to be in front of the client because relationship makes lot of difference okay and so my last question basically we have won some uh, fairly large deals in this quarter so uh, well most of these would likely have been uh, versus tier one so what was the differentiation factor that got us these deals thank you very much so i think the execution quality was uh, in one of the case we were also incumbent but we are very small uh, uh, in comparison to uh, the competition and our execution capability was seen as a big factor in giving that work to us uh, okay uh, in the other case uh, uh, it was the solution that we presented to them and solution when i say it has three components it is one that my technical solution second it is the commercial aspect and third the relationship aspect so all these three things have to come together to make us win and we were able to uh, deliver very superior experience for the client and the level of attention that was needed by them during this time and that made us win so those are the kind of differentiation that happened we also went with our approach of micro vertical and micro horizontal where we could go and challenge that it doesn't matter your incumbent is bigger than us but we can deliver better than them and we were able to demonstrate them through the poc and those approaches and they got the confidence and provided that to us last but not the least the level of attention that we can give it to them by being a smaller company okay so the kind of attention that we gave to them and we committed to them that is the kind of attention that we give to them uh, uh, they were very happy with us and 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 they they went ahead signing those deals with brilla soft thank you very much sir all the very best thank you thank you the next question is from the line of manik taneja from gm financial please go ahead i thank you for the opportunity this is my question is with regard to this uh, this uh, manik can you please be a bit louder just give me a second yeah is this better oh yeah much better yes yeah. yeah so my question uh, to you is with regards to this uh, uh, strategy of uh, cutting the long tail of accounts we've only seen that accelerate in in the first half of this year i just wanted to get your thoughts as to where are we in that journey and uh, how while it has been beneficial from a margin standpoint how much drag would we uh, have seen because of this uh, in the in the recent past there is not much revenue drag that we can see uh, by taking the decisions on the tail account uh, because we are very careful in looking at how do we shift our resources from those tail accounts to more strategic accounts so that means that if we lose something at one place uh, we are significantly growing uh, the revenue at the other place so that there is no negative impact but margin file improve at the same time what we have to look at is not only about the revenue and the margin we have to also look at the level of attention that we can give it to them because even if the account is small it takes away a lot of attention from our account management team and if we want our account management team to be focused on our platinum and gold and silver accounts and not on the tail accounts then we need to get rid of the tail and it is a spring cleaning that we have to continue to do every year and uh, and and i think uh, it should be seen it that way rather than seeing that we will go and sacrifice any revenue or margin because of that sure so is there uh, can you give us some sense as to where are we in that journey should should this should this continue further going forward or you think we've hit the right 
uh, size now in terms of number of customers i think we are pretty much stable now i think we came down to uh, um, very um, you know about 312 or something like that that we have reached uh, uh as far as the tail accounts are concerned it is not there in front of me but but we significantly reduce our our uh, tail accounts yeah now it stands at about 310 just look 310 yeah correct right so uh, yeah. so we have reached to 310 and we are significantly reducing them. but we are pretty much stable here because there are it is not that tail is not there tail is still there but we believe that it is still a tail that is that 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 has an opportunity in it and we should go and mine those accounts so it is about putting a clear focus that yes we can grow that where the account manager or the sales person will take the accountability that we would keep this account because we know that we can grow it so that would mean that the attention will be there on that account and we would start growing them if they don't grow let's say for next six months then we will have to take the decision again on couple of those which we see that despite our all best efforts those are not growing then we will have to cut the tail at the right time sure so today, thank today, you all the best for the continuous process thank you dk all the best thank you thank you very much we'll take that as the last question I would now like to hand the conference back to DK for closing comments. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, once again for joining the, uh, that late during the day. Uh, uh, and as I uh, uh, said, I think our number one priority will remain that we continue to grow quarter on quarter, despite having this blip in the quarter two. I am absolutely very, very positive and upbeat about upcoming quarter. Uh, uh so so from that perspective that remains our first priority second priority as i said will definitely be to continue to improve on our margin and third how do we continue to grow year on year also so that from all aspects we uh, see that our performance is green and uh, i definitely appreciate and thank all of you for your support and i'm sure that we'll continue to come back and continue to create value for all our shareholders thank you very much thank you very much on behalf of birla soft limited that concludes this conference thank you for joining us ladies and gentlemen you may now disconnect your lines